Let's now examine the uses for machine translation. Or, to put it another way, let's ask the question, what is machine translation good for? Before we answer this question, let's take a look back in time at some historical context. In 1949, Warren Weaver wrote and distributed his now famous translation memorandum that kicked off machine translation research in the 20th century. Two years later, in May of 1951, Yehoshua Bar Hillel, an Israeli academic, was hired at MIT as the world's first full time machine translation scholar. One of his first duties at MIT was to determine the current state of the art in machine translation. There were a small number of academic and industrial research labs in the United States that had begun very preliminary experimentation with machine translation. During 1951, Bar Hillel visited these sites and in October of 1951, Bar Hillel published a machine translation survey covering the current state of the art in machine translation. Following that survey, as a follow up, in May of the next year, 1952, Bar Hillel hosted the world's very first machine translation conference. In his 1951 publication on the current state of the art in machine translation, Bar Hillel wrote, It seems obvious that fully automatic machine translation is achievable only at the price of inaccuracy. Bar Hillel recognized as early as 1951 that there was a trade-off between speed, automation, and accuracy. He believed that if you had a human in the loop, that is, if you had a human doing pre-editing or post-editing or both, that you could potentially get fully accurate translations. But if you had fully automatic machine translation, that is, translation without a human in the loop, that you were always going to have some inaccuracy. Throughout the remainder of that decade, 1950 to 1960, there was a lot of hype. The world's first machine translation demonstration was produced at Georgetown, a collaboration between Georgetown and IBM. There was huge amounts of hype around this, and while Bar Hillel and some other researchers were more tentative in what machine translation could accomplish. There were plenty of academic and industrial researchers who claimed that fully automatic, high quality machine translation was just around the corner. Several notable people were quoted in news publications as claiming that fully automatic, high quality machine translation would be accomplished within three to five years. In 1960, Bar Hillel wrote another survey on the state of the art of machine translation. By 1960, there were a lot more research labs pursuing machine translation than there had been in 1951 and 1952. There were research labs in the United States, in Europe, and in Russia. In his 1960 document, Bar Hillel was even more pessimistic than he was in 1952 about the, pros the possibility and likelihood of fully automatic, high-quality machine translation. In his 1960 article, 
Barhalal wrote that fully automatic high quality machine translation is unattainable, quote, not only in the near future, but altogether. In the appendix to his, 1950, uh, to his 1960 article, Barhalal included an example of why he believed that fully automatic, high-quality machine translation was not possible even in principle. This is one of his prime examples. Barhalal gave this example. John was looking for his toy box. Finally, he found it. The box was in the pen. Now, in this example, we have a couple of words that are potentially ambiguous. The most ambiguous and the most relevant here is the word pen. Most commonly in English, pen refers to a writing implement, a pen. But in this example, it's referring to a play pen, a child's play area, enclosed play area. Barhelel points out that the only way to properly translate this sentence is to know that the meaning, the use case of the word pen is as a play enclosure and not as a writing implement. He believed that the only way to solve this problem was the machine would need to know how to reason about the world, would need lots of world knowledge. You would need to know that a box cannot fit inside the kind of pen that is a writing implement. Therefore, and especially because we're in the context of a child playing with his toys, it makes sense that we would be talking about a pen that is a play pen, a play enclosure. This example was Bar Hillel's, uh, what Bar Hillel used to really drive home his point. So, a few years later, the Alpac report came out and came to a relatively similar conclusion six years later in 1966. So, let's move forward to the present day. What is machine translation good for? We are now at the point where there's plenty of machine translation for plenty of language pairs that is sufficiently high quality to be of good use. Some of it is actually very good. For many language pairs and many genres, though, it's still pretty terrible. So what is it good for? Well. That depends on the situation, the use case, and the language pair. Over the next few minutes, I want to walk you through four examples where I have actually used machine translation in my real life. So here we go. One of the most common uses for practical machine translation is in the context of information access. What does that mean? Well, let me give you an example from 2015. In 2015, I traveled from my work here at the University of Illinois to Lisbon, Portugal for EMNLP, which is one of the major natural language processing conferences. It was also the site of that year's WMT, then the Workshop on Machine Translation, a major uh, academic venue where we check on the current state of the art in machine translation. The venue was the site you see here in the center of this map, the Kultergast uh, event center in Portugal, in, in Lisbon. Now, one of the things that you have to do when you're at conferences is eat lunch. And it happened that there were quite a good choice of restaurants right around uh, the, the venue. So every day during the conference, I would meet up with colleagues who I don't usually get to see, and we would wander around the area and find a restaurant. 
So then comes the question, what are you going to eat? Well, I don't speak Portuguese. I don't even speak Spanish or any other Romance language. So I ended up finding menus that looked like this. A few of the things on the menu I could figure out. So for example, looking at this menu, which is actually from one of the restaurants near the venue, I could see that one of the things is a hamburger. Fine, hamburger. Maybe that the third thing is possibly nachos, maybe with meat, I think, uh, and so on. So I could make some guesses, but I really don't like mushrooms. So I wanted to make sure that whatever I ordered didn't have mushrooms, and I didn't know the word for mushrooms in Portuguese. But it was 2015, and by this point, Google Translate had a mobile app. So I would get out my mobile phone. I had pre-downloaded the Portuguese English machine translation pack. So what I was able to do, and you can do this today with your phones, is fire up the Google Translate mobile app and select the OCR, the optical character recognition app, uh, modality. So there's a little icon where you click a picture. I clicked on that. I held my camera on my phone over the menu and the app was able to identify regions that were text recognize that those were Portuguese, convert the image, the image of each line into text, and then run that text through Google's on-device machine translation system and give me a live translation of what was on the menu. So when I looked at my phone, I could see the menu, but the items had been translated from Portuguese into English. And in this way, I was able to figure out, okay, I can safely order this thing. There's no mushrooms on it. It was fantastic. Let's skip forward to 2020. So there is a wonderful restaurant near the University of Illinois campus that I love going to. It's called The Bread Company. It's a family-owned business, and they serve lunch, breakfast, uh, dinner, but one of the things I like to go for, in addition to their to their breakfast sandwiches, is their Zupfer rolls. It's a Swiss-style bakery, and you can order Zupfer rolls, which I'd never heard of before I came to the University of Illinois, but I, I grew to love them. So they're 90 cents, and so often when I was working in my office uh, on campus before the pandemic, I would you, I would very often go to Bread Company and get a mid-afternoon snack. Well, in March of 2020, the global COVID-19 pandemic hit, and for quite a long time, I was unable to make it to campus. Uh, for a good while there, all of the restaurants were closed anyway. So I was working from home, and I really had a craving for the Zupfer rolls. So I got online and searched for Zupfa roll recipes. Well, it turns out that Zupfa is actually a particular dialect of Swiss, Swiss German. It's normally in, the, in, in Switzerland, it's called Zopf, not Zupfa. So I, it took some doing. I do speak German, but I'm not fluent. So I was able to track down some recipes, wasn't completely satisfied, I found the loaf of bread, but I wanted the roll. I eventually found what I was looking for on YouTube. There was one person on YouTube, this uh, video that you see here by this poster, who posted not only a video, but showed how to, uh, how to braid the bread properly. It's a braided roll. I was ecstatic. This was exactly what I was looking for. But there was one problem. I didn't understand all the words in the recipe. So I know enough German to recognize that Salz is salt, that Vollmilch is whole milk, and that Zucker is sugar, and that I is an egg. But I didn't recognize the word Mel, and I didn't recognize the word Hefe. So I needed to look those things up. So I could have gotten my dictionary out. I have a very good 
German to English dictionary from when I was in college and when I studied German. But it was much faster to just get online to Google Translate. So I was on my computer anyway. And so I typed in Hefe. Sure enough, it was yeast. And the other word that I didn't know I found out was flour. And so with that, I was able to get, get all of the ingredients. Eventually, this again was March and April of 2020. So the only way I was able to get yeast was to order it in bulk online. And even that was hard to find. But I found it and I was able to successfully bake over the summer Zupfa rolls in my house for the very first time. It was fantastic. So that was information access. Two examples from my life over the past five years where I've successfully used machine translation to get access to information that I didn't otherwise have in a language that I, wouldn't, that I would not otherwise be able to access. So let's look at the next use case, communication. Now, there were times when I was in Portugal for EMNLP that I wanted to talk to somebody at a restaurant or uh, at a hotel. Now, most of the time, the people I needed to speak to uh, knew enough English that we, could, we could, could communicate, but occasionally I wanted to stretch and try things. I didn't know Portuguese, but what I could do was hold up my phone and do a spoken-to-spoken -spoken translation. So I was able to press a button on the Google Translate app and speak a sentence in English, and it would then translate and do text-to-speech, and the person I was trying to communicate with would hear the my phone speaking in Portuguese. That worked okay. Uh, there are also situations where you want to do this long distance. So when I was booking my hotels, I didn't speak Portuguese. I happened to get lucky and found hotels that I could call uh, that spoke where someone spoke English. Um, and most of the time you can do that by booking online. But occasionally you need to talk to somebody and they just don't share a common language with you. So in 2019, I was trying to get a hold of someone who is in a Spanish speaking country. And I was trying to uh, purchase a gift for this person remotely. And they were in a small, uh, a small city. So the place I wanted to get the gift was a Spanish speaking business owner who didn't speak English at all. I tried, I tried calling and they didn't speak English. About the only thing I know in Spanish is how to say I don't speak Spanish. But I was aware of Skype Translator. So Skype Translator came out a few years ago and using Skype Translator, you can speak to somebody either using Skype, Skype to Skype, or Skype to telephone. And you can speak one language, the other person can speak their own language. I happen to know somebody at Microsoft who worked on this, and my friend at Microsoft worked on Skype Translator from his office in Washington State, and his Microsoft colleague worked on Skype Translator from that colleague's office in Spain. My friend in Washington spoke English. His colleague in Spain spoke Spanish. They talked to each other through Skype Translator, and Skype Translator translated what they, what they spoke to each other. And then when they found bugs, then later in the day, they would go and try to fix those bugs. So in 2019, I was able to attempt to use this to purchase a gift for somebody in Argentina. Turned out it didn't work, not because Skype Translator didn't work, but because there's an automated message at when the person picks up the phone saying this is an automated call. And whenever the person heard that, they hung up. So it didn't work, but not for the reason that I expected. Next, let's look at NLP as part of a larger pipeline. I'm a child of the 80s, and I still have a few of the Lego space sets, Lego Blacktron sets uh, from when I was a kid. And 
every so often I get nostalgic and I want to see how much these sets or the bigger, more expensive sets uh, that I didn't get as a kid would be if I tried to buy them used today. So here's an example of one of the sets that I wanted to look at. This was earlier this summer. And the name of the set is the Lego Message Intercept Base. It's part of the Lego Blacktron series. Now, I wanted to find out how much this was. It was probably going to be something ridiculous, but I wanted to at least uh, indulge my curiosity. So I got on eBay and I typed in the name of this Lego set. And I got some hits, but I didn't just get hits in English. So it turns out that for the past, I don't know, five, six, seven years, a lot of tech companies have started up their own machine translation research groups. So when I was at ACL in 2014, there were tons of companies at the tech exhibit, giving tech exhibits at this uh, computational linguistics conference trying to hire machine translation graduates. And at that time, there were more jobs open for machine translation PhDs than there were uh, graduates to fill them. So eBay was looking, Amazon was looking, a bunch of Chinese companies were looking, uh, Apple was looking, uh, Microsoft was looking, IBM was looking, and I found, I, I actually saw the results of eBay's efforts when I searched for this Lego set. So I didn't just find eBay postings from the United States. I didn't even just find eBay results from English-speaking companies, countries. I also found results from eBay Italy. And so I was able to see an eBay result, someone in Italy posting their used Lego set, describing it in Italian, and I was able to see that result. So what happened? Well, machine translation was being used as part of a larger pipeline. So when I searched in English for message interceptor base, eBay translated that into Italian, translated my search query into Italian, and gave me matches to my query um, among Italian postings in addition to English postings. Finally, machine translation can be used to assist human translators. So this is not a new idea. Way back in 1951, Yehoshua Bar-Hillel foresaw that machine translation could be used by human translators to potentially speed up or make the process easier. Now, it hasn't always worked that way. There have been plenty of cases over the decades where human translators have been pushed to use machine translation when they didn't want to. And for a huge amount of that time, the translations that they got from those machine translation systems were absolutely garbage. And it was a painful process. Now, that still does happen, but much less so than it used to. So for at least a lot of major language pairs where there's a lot of training data, so French to English, Spanish to English, uh, even Arabic to English and Chinese to English, uh, there's, the quality is actually quite good. And so there's plenty of use cases now where professional translators, uh, translation service companies, will use machine translation in their human translation pipeline. So a human translator, when they're working on a document, will have, as part of their user interface, uh, machine translations of every sentence. So one of the things they'll get is translation memory matches. So these are matches from their database of previous translations. And then they may also get a machine translation for each sentence. And then they can choose, do I start from scratch or do I use the machine translation or a translation memory as a starting point. So I want to give you one particular example where this happened to me. So like I said, I don't speak Spanish, I don't speak French, 
but I am a machine translation researcher and I'm interested in accessing machine translation literature, even that literature that's written in other languages. And so when I was doing a literature review one day in 2014-2015, uh, I ran across a machine translation paper that was published at a French venue. So this was a natural language processing conference in France. And it was a paper that I wanted to figure out what it meant. So here's a little snippet. One of the things that machine translation, when it's used in the context of human translation, can potentially do is show confidence scores. So for example, a particular sentence could be highlighted and the highlighting could mean different things, but it may mean, for example, the machine translation system is less confident that its translation of this sentence is good. And so a human translator, if they see that low confidence, they may just choose, uh, I'll start from scratch rather than starting from this unreliable translation. So in this case, I actually used machine translation to translate the document, and then I did the post-editing. So this is called monolingual post-editing. So I'm a monolingual speaker of English. I'm a domain expert in machine translation. So I have a very good language model in my own mind of what types of language I expect to see when I read a machine translation paper. And so I was actually able to do post-editing of this document. And this is the result. So it happened to be a little meta. This was a machine translation article written in French about post-editing. And so you can see from the text here, this is the result of post-editing. And I was able to use this approach, using machine translation uh, to, to post-edit in a way that I was able to get access to the information that I needed to get to, that I wanted to get to. So. What is machine translation good for? Well, probably the most common usage is for information access. Someone is out there, you want to, you, you, speak, a, you speak one or more languages, there's content in a different language that you either don't speak or aren't completely comfortable in, and you want to access that information. Or you want to communicate. You want to do text chatting, or voice-to-voice -voice communication with someone who you don't share a comfortable common language. There's also plenty of cases where machine translation is used behind the scenes as part of a larger NLP pipeline that you might not even be aware that machine translation is happening. And finally, there are plenty of cases where machine translation is used to assist a human translator in doing their job.